Tracy has been the town historian of West Hartford since 2004. She has a PhD in history from Brown University, and she's also a graduate of Trinity College. Um, and she's done quite a bit of research on Beatrice Fax Auerbach. So we're looking forward to, um, uh, to what she has to tell us this evening. Um, and if you just joined us recently, we're um, asking people who would like to, to share any memories of the G Fax department store in Hartford um, through the chat, and we can collect um, some memories that way while, while we're listening to Tracy. Um, she's also invited you to ask any questions as we go along. Um, and I will be glad to convey those questions to her if uh, it seems like the, the best time to ask those questions. Okay, so handing it over to Tracy Wilson now. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I'm so excited to be here, uh, to be here tonight. Uh, last year, I appeared in person uh, at the Jewish Historical Society. And uh, so this, this year, I'm excited to be back electronically. The pandemic has really changed our daily patterns and it has facilitated these virtual meetings that potentially allow more people to participate. I have a friend here from uh, North Truro who's uh, on the Zoom. I have a brother from Duxbury, Mass and his wife who I see. I have a son and sister-in-law from Chicago who are on, a daughter from DC. So it's really fun to uh, that they have the chance to, uh, at least I hope it's going to be fun that they have the chance to be part of this. Uh, I especially want to recognize uh, three of Mrs. Auerbach's granddaughters who are here, and I know they don't like it when I do this, but anyways, I, I know that Rena Koopman, Tracy Koopman, and Brooksy Koopman are here. Uh, I take it as a great unintended consequence of this work to get to know them over the past four years as I test out ideas and receive documents that help me to tell their grandmother's story. I'd be remiss if I didn't start by bearing witness to the times we are in, a pandemic that will today probably count 4,000 deaths in Connecticut a time that highlights the systemic inequities in our healthcare system, in employment, in our justice system, and in our system of policing. I want to take a moment of silence for us to feel for those who have died, for those who are suffering, and for those who continue to strive to build a more equitable world. Thanks so much. And again, I'm so glad to be with you, if only virtually. Uh, so now I'm gonna share my screen and uh, so uh, the documents can speak for me. Um, and uh, hopefully this will all go off as planned. Okay. Beatrice Fox Sauerbach is something of a rock star here in the Hartford area. And just putting her name on a talk brings in an adoring audience. But I think the narratives about her have still not done enough to tell her story. So many champion her as a one of a kind, an unusual woman, a woman ahead of her times. As any historian worth their salt, I want to challenge that notion. I too think she did things in this community beyond what many others have done. There are Auerbach Halls, Auerbach Scholarships, the Auerbach Foundation, the Auerbach Chair, the Auerbach Wing, the Auerbach Art Lab Library, and Our Farm. My question today is, how is she a woman in her times? How did she represent Connecticut and American life in the 1940s and 1950s? How unusual was she? Was she really a one of a kind? Studying Mrs. Auerbach has made me think a lot about the time in which she led between the 1930s and 1960s. This is not ordinarily seen as a time for women's leadership and I'm captured by this question of whether she was an unusual woman who stood above and was exceptional or she was uh, 
or she lived within a web of people who uh, did some of the same work she did. In fact, this is a story of women who widened our idea of the role of women in the 1950s with both their words and actions. Their friendships, working relationships, and accomplishments changed the way I think of women in the 1950s. While the store, G. Fox, was making women into the consummate consumers, at the same time, Auerbach's position as the president of G. Fox showcased women's leadership outside the domestic sphere. These women make me question my image of women's role in the 1950s and my reality. My parents moved to the suburbs. My mother quit working at Fox's, uh, kept house uh, being a wife and mother and a community volunteer, not working or leading. This reality is reinforced by Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, where Friedan makes the case that women who are housewives and mothers are not happy in this world, but she glosses over, as do most narratives of the 50s, the role that women leaders already played. Is Beatrice Fox Auerbach a window into a web of women's leadership that just hasn't reached the public eye? And I wonder, how can she become more of a part of the Connecticut story and the national story? How does her life help us help tell the story of our state and of women in our country? Let's see. I hope this talk uh, can also be interactive and that some of you are familiar with the chat function. So uh, Elizabeth already talked about that. Uh, she'll be monitoring the chat and she is welcome to break in to relay the questions because it's hard for me to do this and be following the chat function. So she's going to be my eyes on that. Uh, the, inter uh, the interactive feature is a good one, so uh, try to make it work. I always like to start with the question, did any of you ever shop at G Fox? You can signify by raising your hands, giving a thumbs up on your screen, uh, or chatting it. Um, and I can't really see all of you here, but I'm imagining I had some hands in the air there. Um, and then secondly, are there any people here who actually worked at G Fox? Tracy, I'm telling you from the chat that we have several people who've identified themselves as having worked at the store. Um, oh, awesome. Oh, that's great. Tonight. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully they can share their stories. Okay. The era of the department store from the 1890s to about 1980 brought consumerism to a new level. These palaces of consumption drew people into a new type of shopping experience. And Beatrice Fox Auerbach was a champion at getting people in her store. G. Fox was the largest privately owned department store in the United States and the sixth largest overall in the US in the 1950s, the heyday of the department store. My mother worked there in the late 1940s. And when we shopped there in the early 1960s, she told us stories about Mrs. Auerbach's rose boutonniere that she wore to work every day, of her gathering her employees on the first floor while she stood on the mezzanine and spoke to them, and of her knowing her employees' names and being a hands-on type of boss. These personal stories glorified this small and stature woman in my eyes, and 55 years later, when I started to research her, prompted by my wife Beth's three-year stint serving as the executive director at Our Farm, I made my way into a world of women's leadership that continues to impress me and changes my vision of the history of women in the 1940s and 50s. My talk today includes sections on Our Farm, Our Back as an employer, Our Back as a leader of the Service Bureau for Women's Organizations, and our back as friend and traveler. Through these stories, I hope you get a sense of what motivated her, what made her life meaningful, and this web of women, women among whom she lived, and how that can revise our ideas about women in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Here is Beatrice with her flagship 11-story department, 11 department store on Main Street in Hartford. This logo, was known throughout the state, their byline serving Connecticut since 1847, appeared on the nearly 150 delivery trucks that made their way to consumers for items as small as a spool of thread. 
She was one of two granddaughters of the founder of G. Fox, Gerson Fox, and the daughter of Moses and Teresa Fox. Uh, Teresa Fox. Uh, she married George Auerbach in 1911 at age 24 and settled with him in Utah in the re retailing business. She moved back to Hartford in 1917 after the G. Fox store burned to the ground and she and her husband helped as the store was rebuilt. They never left. Their first daughter, Georgette, was born in 1916 in Utah and Dorothy was born in 1919 in Hartford. At that time, though Beatrice never graduated from high school or college, she took courses at, Hartford business, at a Hartford business school to study accounting and she spent some time in the store. In 1925, she and George bought their home at 1040 Prospect Avenue. And in the same year, they bought our farm. Their children were nine and six. Neither she nor her husband knew anything about farming. At that point, um, so uh, this is in 1925. Just two years later, her husband died. They had been married just 16 years. Her children were 11 and eight. At that point, her parents uh, moved into 1040 Prospect and she began to work at the store, sitting, as I guess some people would say, at her father's knee, but at a desk next to him uh, to learn the business. Her mother died just five years later in 1932 and her father, by then 82 years old, became more dependent on her. When he died in 1938, she had to be ready to be uh, the head of the store. And she became president and led it until 1965 for 27 years from ages 51 to 78. Our farm is part of the legacy she left to the Hartford area. Here is their account book showing their purchase of the 324 acre farm and retreat. Uh, these books, this account book um, can be found and the greatest number of their papers can be found in the Koopman collection at the Connecticut Historical Society. You can see the price of the farm, $35,000. Um, and here's how she pay, here's how they paid Dolores Perkins. Um, the Perkins had bought the farm in the early 1900s and they uh, wanted to make it into a model farm uh, which they had but then Mr. Perkins died and it was kind of in disrepair and overgrown when they uh, finally got it. Uh, George had been one of the founders of the Tumblebrook Country Club which is uh, right along Simsbury Road here not very far from where our farm is um, and these two side-by-side -side maps give you a sense of the farm. Here it is today, Simsbury Road. You can see, let me see if I can get my pointer here. Uh, you can see Simsbury Road and uh, this is Cider Hill. Um, and then this area is where the um, barns are and the animals today. The thing that I like about this map is um, same, same thing in 1934. Um, this is where the miniature orchard is today, but look at all these trees all the way up the hill. This whole thing was an orchard um, and Perkins had planted something like 37 different varieties of apples and um, you can see that today a lot of this is just meadow um, and they've just sort of restored the, the miniature apple uh, farm. <clears throat> uh, so, um, Beatrice and George wanted to set this up as a model farm. Of course, um, he soon died and it uh, was really in uh, these farm managers that they hired that kept uh, that work to the farm um, very effectively um, until the uh, mid 1960s. And one of Mrs. Auerbach's ideas was uh, to have it as a model farm and bring people from all over Connecticut to come and see how the farm worked. Uh, she also invited people from all over the world, world which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the farm also served as the summer home for Mrs. Auerbach and her daughters and their husbands and their grandchildren. 
Um, so this is, uh, she sent out a Christmas card every year. Uh, here's winter at our farm. Um, and I just think about her. She had uh, made a lot of money. She was uh, financially very uh, well off at this point. And she, um, this was what she built for her summer home. I just think it's a, a really interesting commentary on who she was. Um, so she built her summer retreat in 1940, the year both her daughters married. She spent from June to October at our farm each year. And then in 1944, as the family grew, uh, she built another log cabin just to the south, the one she lived in. This house had a view into downtown Hartford. And if any of you have a chance to walk up Cider Hill, it's now part of a state park. Um, it's just a beautiful sight. Uh, and for not a lot of sweat, you can get yourself to a point where you can see um, up to the Hubline Tower and into downtown Hartford and on a clear day up to Mount Tom. Just a beautiful spot. Excuse me, Tracy, we just had a quick question. Yes. Do you, sure. Do you happen to know the name of the artist of, the, of that card? I do not. I haven't ever thought of that. Okay. Uh, I don't. And I don't know if any of the uh, granddaughters would know uh, who did these, but she she had did them every year. Great, thank you. Uh, but they they each have a little bit of a different style, so I don't know if it's all the same person. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to make more, uh, so um, this is uh, both the houses had these gorgeous fireplaces in them and then looked out over a ravine, which had grown up. Uh, when the when this area became a state park uh, three or four years ago, part of the deed was that they had to tear these homes down so that they don't exist anymore. They're just grown over with grass now. Um, but luckily I got some pictures before they, um, before they were gone. Um, so uh, this was down in the ravine. This was a natural swimming pool. Um, they had AI Savin Construction Company design the spring-fed swimming pool in 1944. Abraham Savin, who lived in Bloomfield, also built the Gold Star Memorial Bridge across the Thames River in New London, the Baldwin Bridge over the Connecticut River, and the Charter Oak Bridge in Hartford. He had some credentials. And you can see this is quite a pool big enough to have the rowboat, uh, the rowboat in it. Uh, so um, let me just see where I am. So the farm run by her farm manager uh, was a model farm which attracted people from the Farm Bureau on a regular basis. It also became a retreat for the Auerbachs and uh, family and it became a place to invite visitors from around the world. Mrs. Auerbach sent notes to retirees as the seasons changed. And in this one, she wrote, as I drive into town from the farm on these cool, crisp mornings and see the trees taking on their glorious autumn colors, it makes me happy that I live in this New England state with its changing seasons. It is so peaceful and lovely at the farm that I plan to stay as long as, I, as long as possible, but know as soon as the weather gets a bit colder, we'll welcome the advantages of city, city living. Do hope you are all well and happy and this brings as always my warmest greetings to you. Most sincerely your friend, Beatrice Fox Auerbach. So interesting to me how she um, is so positive about living in New England and living in Connecticut and she, she really, uh, in the store and their advertising and in the whole idea of the store was about uh, Connecticut living and uh, how she could provide what people needed to um, for Connecticut living, which was different than living in the city. At this point in 1957, she was 70 years old. The, star was, the store was the largest privately owned department store in the country. Her main sentiments here are, is that it was peaceful and lovely at the farm. When she drove into town to Fox's as the president of the firm, she thought deeply about her labor force and labor practices. 
1938, she was one of the first retail presidents to institute a 40 hour, five day work week with Sundays and Mondays off when the store was closed. Other department stores in Hartford followed. She provided workers with an employee cafeteria where food was served at cost and met much of the food from the farm. Um, the, the farm focused, the, the, as you saw, there's an orchard. Uh, so they had an orchard, they had poultry and eggs, and they had cows and dairy, so um, uh, milk. Uh, medical facilities at the store, she had rooms in area hospitals that were hers that her employees could go to if necessary, and they provided uh, relaxing rooms. They had employee bulletins, departmental picnics that both, both blacks and whites attended, and group activities for all employees. This is her father, Moses Fox, here in the background. In 1940, she had Sentinel Hill Hall built on the 11th floor, an auditorium to seat more than 500 people, uh, and the space controlled by a woman. At its dedication, Mrs. Helen Rogers Reed, vice president of the New York Herald Tribune, was invited. I think I've got a picture here, yeah. Um, and uh, she spoke at the formal opening of the hall. She said, the opening of this beautiful hall as an extension of the highest type of store service is an example of what, woman, what one woman can do in a democracy. Future meetings within these walls can be glorified descendants of the Cracker Barrel gatherings in the general store of early days when affairs of the nation were discussed around the central stove by men. Women's organizations that have now taken over a large part of the development of public opinion in their communities, giving nonpartisan support to worthwhile issues will value the hospitality that Mrs. Auerbach is announcing today. It may result in a kind of town hall of Hartford under the management of women. And I want to congratulate you all, those who have created this delightful auditorium and the club women of Connecticut who are enjoying its benefits and will carry on the leadership they have long shown among women in democracy. This was the site of many meetings and of travelogues of Mrs. Auerbach's trips. Democracy and equality are important to Auerbach, not just in word, but also in deed. Auerbach was one of the first department store leaders to hire African-Americans. In 1942, having black employees do direct service with customers and having them on the ladder to promotion was really unusual. According to an article in the National Urban League's magazine, Opportunity, G. Fox was one of the few department stores in the United States where a black employee could work hard and get a promotion. And as the magazine said, know that whether he makes it or not depends entirely upon himself, the ability to make the grade. 71 years ago in 1949, during the Christmas buying season, the store had 3,500 employees with more than 300 blacks. During the rest of the year, there were about 2,500 employees with 250 blacks who worked as sales clerks, telephone dispatchers, clerical workers, inspector wrappers, sewing machine operators, floor stock handlers, and in the more traditional job of elevator operator. Several served in supervisory jobs, including uh, the woman shown here, Sarah Murphy, who was a person personnel counselor. Murphy served in the Women's Army Corps, the WACs, uh, during the war and graduated from NYU's personnel administration program. According to Tracy Parker in her new book, Department Stores and the Black Freedom Movement, Murphy was first assigned to the lingerie department, which was a bold move for Auerbach. According to Parker, traditionally whites objected to African-Americans whom they regarded as unclean and diseased, handling their intimate clothing. Murphy was not an anomaly. A black woman who started as an inspector raptor, rapper in the children's clothing department in 1942 was promoted to head of stock in this department after several years of strong performance. Parker argues that, quote, this merit hiring at G. Fox occurred 
without protest or much agitation, unquote. A big part of the success was caused by Auerbach's strong stance that if there was a problem, it lay with the white employees, not the ones who are African-American. I think that's a really um, important point. It wasn't like they were going to move uh, the African-American employee to where they would feel, quote unquote, more comfortable. Um, they, they went to the white person and said, you've got to figure this out. According to an article in The Crisis, the magazine of the Urban League, Hartford was seen as a difficult city race relations wise. No black person was employed as a teacher in the Hartford Public Schools until after World War II. Blacks made up only about 7% of Harvard's population at this time, but it was clear that employment doors were shut hard in the faces of those seeking quote unquote non-Negro jobs. The article went on to argue that there was no other young Negro woman who holds a position such as Miss Murphy's in a major department store in the US. There were 4,100 stores in the country. According to the director of personnel, uh, there was barely a ripple when blacks were hired. He also said, quote, in only a few instances have we had employees tell us that they will not work beside a Negro. In such instances, we talk to these employees about fairness and democracy in action. And if this does not work, we simply restate our employment policy and do not re retreat from it, um, unquote. The article ends with a quote from Mrs. Auerbach. Why should one race have opportunity in only special jobs? Why shouldn't they become the best sales clerks, the best supervisors, or whatever they have the ability to become? This is our way of thinking. Here, Auerbach stood apart from her fellow presidents. These employment practices were also part of her business model to serve the community and grow her consumer base. 1964, at age 77, she and Jackie Robinson received the National Human Relations Award given by the National Conference of Christians and Jews. She was as, pr she was as proud of this award, she said, than any other she received. Just to put this in perspective, in 1964, uh, this is also the year of Freedom Summer in Mississippi to register Blacks to vote and the year the Civil Rights Act was passed. Come back. These employment policies began during World War II, or begun during World War II, were part of the African American fight for a double V victory during World War II victory over the fascists abroad and victory over discrimination at home. Auerbach's policies made a systemic step toward equality here in Hartford. The United States emerged as a superpower in the world in its support of equality and democracy and its support of human rights through the United Nations. As the store capacity grew after World War II and Mrs. Auerbach understood what it took to run the store with her leadership team in place, she became a more vocal advocate for human rights and began an organization which joined two issues of great importance to her, working with women in leadership positions and developing international ties on a person-to-person -person basis through exchange programs and through her travels. This newspaper article from the Hartford Current dated January 7th, 1945, before World War II ended, but right after the meeting at Dumbarton Oaks, which helped to form the United Nations. The article describes that the Service Bureau for Women's Organizations uh, will increase the effectiveness of women's work through organized effort. This organization would coordinate uh, and support the efforts of women leading groups in the state, such as the League of Women Voters, the Girl Scouts, the PTA, the National Council of Jewish Women, and uh, the YWCA. Ms. Sauerbach was the chair of the advisory board. Those who joined her on this board were like a who's who in women's leadership. Ms. Florence Harrison, who was the secretary of this board at first, she spent eight years as a field secretary for the National League of Women Voters and was a professor at Connecticut College. She helped start the major in retailing at Connecticut College, which included an internship at G. Fox each summer. Edith Cook, 
the head of the Department of Government and Legal Status of Women for the National League of Women Voters. Dr. C.E.A. Winslow, uh, it's a woman listed here as Mrs. C.E.A. Winslow. Uh, she was a doctor and professor at the School of Public Health at Yale University. Dr. Dorothy Shafter, president of Connecticut College. Mrs. John Lee, also uh, Percy Maxim Lee. Uh, she was the president of the National League of Women Voters. Mrs. Laura Gorton, at, at one time the president of the Connecticut State Federation of Women's Clubs and the president of the National Association of Real Estate Boards. Uh, Mrs. Bernard Shiro, who is her second daughter, and then Mrs. Chase Going Woodhouse, professor at Connecticut College, U.S. representative to Congress, elected twice from the district around New London. With this organization, Auerbach surrounded herself with women leaders in the state and the world. In 1943, she started talking about building this organization by consulting the state leaders. She wanted to establish a statewide nonprofit educational service to assist voluntary organizations in planning and executing their own programs and developing among their members leadership, perception and understanding in areas of their interest. The main issues for the organization were education, international relations, and child health. 1949, she endowed the Service Bureau with $6 million, uh, which I use the inflation calculator, comes out to $65 million today. Starting then, they could spend $300,000 per year without doing any fundraising. By the 1960s, there were 13 people on the payroll. And the Service Bureau is what led to her friendship with um, Eleanor Roosevelt and Chase Going Woodhouse. Um, let me just see if it's, okay. Um, the, um, the first time Mrs. Auerbach asked Eleanor Roosevelt to speak to the Service Bureau, was on April 10th, 1946 at Sentinel Hill Hall at the G. Fox department store. She came to talk about the United Nations, which she claimed was the most practical approach to world brotherhood yet devised. She emphasized the role of women in building cooperation among nations for the feminine influence for peace can, if wisely used, be really effective. Uh, that evening, the Hartford Jewish Federation asked Mrs. Roosevelt to speak at the Bushnell, so Hartford got two talks out of her. Uh, and that talk was, this is what I saw, telling of the need for Jewish relief in Europe. Auerbach said that Roosevelt was there to represent the United Nations, an organization, uh, I'm skipping ahead of myself here, an, an organization that for all its imperfections is the most practical approach to world brotherhood yet devised by man. Roosevelt spoke on the international approach to social, humanitarian, and cultural questions evolving from her work on UN committees. She emphasized the particular role of women to build cooperation among nations for the feminine influence for peace can, if wisely used, be really effective. Maybe we could use that today. Those in the Women's Service Bureau had a lot of opportunities to learn about the United Nations, knowing that the Service Bureau sponsored trips to the United Nations every year. This speaking engagement was the start of a friendship that lasted for 16 years. This is the first of 180 letters that exist between the two women between 1946 and 1962 when Eleanor Roosevelt died. This first personal invitation for lunch led to many more talks for the Service Bureau, visits to our farm and, and Tanglewood together and overnight stays in Hartford at our farm and in New York City. And this is Eleanor Roosevelt's um, home in, uh, at Valkill, as you can see here, Valkill Cottage, Cottage in Hyde Park. I can imagine them sitting there having breakfast on this porch in the morning.
And, and Auerbach did not just talk about international relations, she invited guests into her home. This page from her guest book in October 1946, this one to the right here, um, boasts visitors from Nagoya City, Japan, Johannesburg, South Africa, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Czechoslovakia, Montevideo, Uruguay, Colombo, Ceylon, Rome, Italy, and Paris, France. She welcomed them to her store and to Sentinel Hill Hall, where she ran many programs, and she welcomed many to the farm uh, during the summer months. So just about a month after the Declaration of Human Rights was declared on December 12th, 1948, Roosevelt was back in town. <clears throat> January 9th, 1949, or 19th, Roosevelt spoke to the Women's Service Bureau at Sentinel Hill Hall as part of the Bureau's series of meetings devoted to international relations. A thousand people came to hear her, including eight girls chosen from area high schools. Roosevelt put us squarely in the middle of the Cold War. She said, quote, the whole struggle between democracy and totalitarianism acquits itself in a world in which we are playing for very high stakes. Russia has made one valuable contribution. It has kept before us the failure of democracy. Roosevelt emphasized that the battleground is here in the United States, only as we show, not talk, but show that actually here democracy exists and where we fail that we are really, really making an effort to change. We will win the moral victory. She did not take any credit for her chairmanship of the Commission on Human Rights. She cited the passage of the declaration as a victory for the moral view of individual freedom. She said the UN cannot assure peace, but only work to create the climate. Arbach did much in her power to create a climate where women could talk about important human rights issues. Roosevelt's idea of creating a climate, today, today we might say a context for talking about human rights, in some ways is what many protesters today are talking about. In her My Day column on March 2nd, 18, uh, 1950, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote about the Service Bureau. She wrote, Mrs. Auerbach and Miss Harrison have a program which is gaining tremendously in importance through the state of Connecticut. It serves the women of the entire state, helps the women to understand the problems not only of our own country, but in the world at large, and gives them an opportunity to come in touch with people who are carrying out the policies of our government today. They also try to bring the women of Connecticut in contact with women from other lands who come to our shores. And just at present, there are a great many in a variety of fields coming here to see what life in the United States is really like. A year and a half later, in this letter of September 21st, 1951, Beatrice writes to Eleanor before Eleanor goes off to Paris and India in a letter which certainly is now showing the depth of friendship. She says, uh, we can read by the green arrow, once again, my heartfelt and my deepest thanks for all that you have done and are doing for youth, democracy, and for your many personal friends among whom I am immodest enough to include myself. And it's interesting as you read through the 180 letters, when you look at the salutations and uh, how they're signed, uh, they, you, you just see this uh, change from being very formal to uh, more friendly, though almost always signing first and last names, uh, but this one gratefully and sincerely. In 1956, the Service, Service Bureau held their annual meeting. And you can see that this conference held over two days uh, drew 350 women. And Eleanor Roosevelt as a speaker, as well as Lillian Gilbreth. The Service Bureau featured programs on refugees in Pakistan, two United Nations trips, a talk on Southeast Asia, a talk on Berea College, a look at colonialism, and two programs called A Look at the World. Photos show participants in the 1955 conference from Germany, Britain, Israel, Denmark, 
and a woman on a panel from the National Council of Negro Women speaking about women and freedom with John Oakes of the New York Times and a professor from Harvard. This organization was clearly an avenue for Auerbach and, and Woodhouse to push their human rights agenda. When I see this picture of Florence Harrison, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Beatrice Fox Auerbach, and two women who we're n we don't know, but would love to know if anyone out there knows who they are, the two on the right. Um, uh, I believe taken some time in the 50s and probably in the summer looking at their dresses. I have to say, I wish I could be sitting at that table, uh, leaning in like Florence Harrison is doing. Oh. How luck lucky would you have been to be sitting at table number one, awaiting a dinner with these women? Um, so if anyone knows these two women on the right, please chat their names. Florence Harrison was heavily involved in the Women's Bureau in the 40s and 50s. By 1965, the organization had office space at the store where a nine woman staff provided assistance, consultation and information to individuals and organizations. The organization taught women about Robert's rules of order and how to build an organization. At the same time, Auerbach provided many programs right at her department store. The women met in the Sentinel Hill Hall Auditorium. The Sentinel Hill Teen Club offered regular planned programs to over 1,500 girls, all funded by the Beatrice Fox Auerbach Foundation. I guess I'd like to know this joke as well and be listening to this conversation. Chase going Woodhouse to the left here is pictured with Eleanor Roosevelt and Beatrice Fox Auerbach. Uh, she led the Women's Service Bureau from its inception into the 1980s. She served two terms as Secretary of State in Connecticut, 1940 to 1942, two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1945 to 47 and from 1949 to 51. Eleanor Roosevelt actually campaigned for her. She was an economics professor at Connecticut College, only the second Democrat to teach there. Uh, she was an author, a political activist, and a mother of two. Chase's obituary reads, she was an ardent supporter of the United Nations. Six months before its establishment in 1945, she said, enduring peace can be achieved only by the peoples of the earth associating themselves in an international organization an international community in which each has rights, but also responsibilities to help make certain that peace and justice are supreme in the world. She was an early proponent of women's rights in the workplace. She sponsored a bill in the 79th Congress calling for equal pay for equal work. By 1949, had reintroduced a revision to that bill. She said her bill was not concerned with wage rates, seniority, or bonus pay. All it was concerned with, she said, was the basic rates for men and women in comparable jobs. At age 90, she was still a member of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women. She was Beatrice's main travel partner. Um, they took these six trips uh, in the late 40s and into the 1950s. Um, and these trips were anywhere from six to 10 weeks. Um, Auerbach was quick to speak uh, to her employees when she returned. A, a former Bloomfield resident, Lorraine Bulba, remembered when she was at one of my talks uh, going to hear a lecture that uh, Mrs. Auerbach gave when she got back from her trip to Sub-Saharan, when she got back from her trip to Africa um, in 1953. And she still remembered uh, her saying, uh, Ms. Sauerbach saying at the end of the talk, you know, they are just like you and me. This was a powerful statement at a time when movies like Tarzan espoused white superiority and colonialism was at its height, just the beginning of the civil rights movement. Her 100 page diary of this trip is another talk. As I study these women, I see them working on issues of global understanding as they supported one another. This is the height of the Cold War, and for Beatrice, it was a time to travel to countries caught up in the Cold War. 
This was a time to invite visitors from across the world to home experiences here in Connecticut. In 1966, the Service Bureau gathered 384 visitors, including exchange students and State Department visitors. Members of the Service Bureau listened to guest speakers from Nigeria, Tunisia, East and West Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sudan, Nepal, and Turkey. The largest number of international visitors in 1966 came from the Philippines, Korea, India, Venezuela, Thailand, and Iran. According to the 1966 report, um, and this is a quote, among the more unusual visitors were two Afrikaners, a minister and his wife from the Union of South Africa. They had been studying right-wing organizations in the United States. The Service Bureau arranged an afternoon meeting for them with five Negro leaders of Hartford. It was an enlightening afternoon for both sides and the only time the visitors had an opportunity for a realistic discussion of racial tension in the United States. My guess is she was part of setting that up. Working together to develop these programs led to deep friendships among the women. Auerbach invited Eleanor Roosevelt many times to sleepovers at the farm. Uh, Roosevelt wrote about this in her My Day column in July 1951. On Wednesday, Ms. Thompson and I went to Mrs. Beatrice Auerbach's farm near Hartford, Connecticut, a more perfect place for a busy woman I cannot imagine. Mrs. Auerbach can be at her office in Hartford in 15 minutes, and when she returns to the farm, she is in a complete wilderness. The cabins are set among the trees, and when the sun filters through in the morning, it is a sight to behold. Around my cabin were many white birches, and I could just glimpse below in the hollow uh, the blue sheen of the water in the swimming pool. I felt quite at home, for only screens surrounded my bedroom, the windows having been taken out for the summer. Breakfast on the porch in the morning was deliciously cool and quiet. And this is a page from the guest book at the farm in 1960 with Eleanor Roosevelt's notation, to a dear friend with thanks and deep admiration and warm love, Eleanor Roosevelt. The Our Farm Retreat 1040 Prospect and Sentinel Hill Hall were places to entertain, learn, and network with friends and visitors from around the world. What united these women was their abiding interest in the ideals of democracy and how citizens could learn how to actively participate in a democratic society. They believed in the dignity of every individual. Beatrice did much to humanize those who worked for her, those who visited, and those who helped to build women's, women leaders. These were women who spent their lives in the public world, something different from our image of women in the 50s. Their stories need to be told and retold. Their system building, global understanding, public speaking, and work for the common good built a rich foundation for the women's move, movement in the 1960s. Was she unique? Yes. Was she a woman ahead of her times? No, she was a woman of her times. Was she part of a movement as well? She helped to build this web of women through her work as president of GFOC, through the Service Bureau, and through her desire to learn through her travels and relationships with people with international backgrounds. She is iconic in this area, and yet it is also powerful to think of her as one of many women committed to make the world a better place. Maybe when you think about the women's movement, I've shifted your gaze a little bit. Um, I, I want to make the argument that it started before the 1960s and the networks of women leaders that Beatrice Fox Auerbach worked so actively to create. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, it definitely gives a lot to think about. Um, just to relay a couple of questions that have come up so far. Um, sure. Uh, Jackie Lee asked what happened to the Service Bureau? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, and some others may be able to help me with it. But it, um, it lasted into the 1980s, I think. Um, and it remained at G Fox, um, the, its headquarters. Um, uh, my wife, Beth, wants to know what happened to the money. Where did all that money go? Uh, but it was a function of the 
Secretary of State's office, I guess. So um, I, I don't know um, how it how it ended. Uh, the papers for the Women's Service Bureau are, are at the Dodd Center at UConn, and I still haven't had a chance to read them. So yeah. I look forward to the chance to doing that. Wonderful. I'm um, going back a little bit into the family history. Somebody wanted mm -hmm. to know um, how uh, Gershon Fox ended up in Hartford in the first place. Do you know? I don't know. He I was just, a German immigrant. Yeah. But do you know? Well, I looked up, I knew that Connecticut Historical Society has a little bit about the family on their yes. site, and it just says yep. he uh, was born in Bavaria and he immigrated to the U.S. as a young man and settled in Hartford by the early 1840s and worked as a peddler before opening a fancy goods store with his brother in 1847. Mm -hmm. um, and he did marry in Hartford. I think that was part of the question as well. Mm -hmm. um, a woman from Germany also. Um, Thank you. So <laughs> I, believe, I believe that he came to Hartford because there was a large German, German Jewish community in Hartford uh, that came over before the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. uh, the night uh, before 1900. Mm -hmm. right. yes, that, that was, he, that was yeah. true for sure, but it was true of several other cities along the East Coast. So um, I don't know if we know exactly why Hartford, but um, but it was a, a destiny. Because somebody, somebody in Hartford, he knew somebody in Hartford and they brought him. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, that's how they all came. Yeah, that's, sure. the, way, that's the way they immigrated. Including my grandmother. Oh. So um, while Harriet's on, she was telling us that um, her uncle was a childhood friend of Beatrice Auerbach's and that she visited him in Australia on one of her trips. Hmm. She's very interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, do people have other questions? Uh, they could, you could uh, put them in the chat or if you want to unmute and speak, that would be okay also. Just give another minute. One of, <laughs> one of the things that is very important about Mrs. Arbat is that she was extremely generous and people never knew what she was donating to whom. She mm. always kept it uh, as anonymous. Thanks for sharing that. We know uh, from Maimonides that's the highest level of uh, Sadaka, right? Yes. Absolutely. Well, she's, she was part of the Debor Society, which was the precursor of the sisterhood at Temple Beth Israel. And what they did is they would knit shrouds for the deceased. She also never forgot her friends from when she was growing up. Uh, particularly Julia Katzenstein, who um, was not very well healed, but there was never a time that my parents and I visited Julia Katzenstein that there were, weren't flowers from Mrs. A in her apartment. It's lovely, thank you. Um, Tracy, we had a question, if you know what Auerbach's hopes were for the hour farm when she donated it to the 4-H or did that happen after after her death? Yeah, in, in 1965 she um, she uh, retired and she sold the store to uh, and Macy's bought the store and someone will know this better than I but the 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 Downtown store keeps going for a while. Then West Farms Mall opens in 1974, and uh, so uh, a satellite uh, G Fox opened there, and soon after it closes downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, but she uh, sells the. They had a, a herd of cows at the farm, and those are sold, I believe, in 1966, and then. Um, she uh, gives the, uh, she allows kids from the 4-H to, well, the first part is that they just sort of work the orchard. 
and then uh, the rest of the farm is given um, uh, actually to Yukon, to the agricultural extension that's tied in with the 4-H, uh, to be an educational farm, but also to be a farm that uh, particularly educates uh, students from the city. So uh, for her, it was a retreat and she wanted it to be that for uh, for children from the city. And even before it was uh, a nonprofit, um, she would sponsor classes of students to go and visit the farm. Interesting, thank you. It was uh, striking to me while you were talking about Eleanor Roosevelt visiting her there that it it seems to have been kind of parallel to what Val Kill was for, mm. for Roosevelt, like a, a very simple, like, you know, materially simple, yes. but uh, a very like appreciated retreat where yes. also where, and also a place where uh, she made connections with other women who were interested in the same issues that she was. Um, yeah. So that space thing is really interesting. Um, well, so thank so I, I'd like to add some things. Tracy, thank you so much for, for describing um, Mrs. Auerbach. I moved to Connecticut in 1955 from New York and coming from New York, it was incredible that there was a department store in Hartford that was kind of like a New York department store. But the thing that was just so amazing for me was that a woman was heading it and a Jewish woman was heading it. So for me, that was just a remarkable, remarkable thing happening in Hartford. Um, and I never, never forgot it. In um, 1964, when I was working downtown, going, um, uh, working and um, going to college, and she had a, in the um, Sentinel Hill Hall, there was a lecture series that was just remarkable uh, that she had, it was a free lecture series. Um, for women, about careers, about current events. It was free. And the number of women who went, and, and I think there was even lunch provided, it was just a remarkable thing. And I went for a couple of years, when I had two years when I was um, working downtown uh, during college. And the professionalism, I mean, no other department store anywhere would do something like that. So she impressed me for many, many reasons. And then as, um, as the years went by and I read about her travels and her um, her incredible charitable um, <laughs> um, donations. Uh, this was a very, very special woman, and we were very fortunate to have her in Hartford. So it was good. It was very special. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for sharing. Oh, may I add? Uh, one day, my mother was shopping in uh, the first floor, and she was looking at the ties. There was just nobody around, and she wasn't really doing anything but looking around and I guess she was waiting for someone and all of a sudden this woman came over and said madam may I help you and my mother looked up and it was Mrs. Arbach coming over to wait on her. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Um, we had a, uh... if, you need, if you needed a, a birthday card you could call up and they would read you the birthday cards so that you could pick out the card you wanted <laughs> and they would deliver it. A 10 wow. cent birthday card they would deliver. <sighs> I'm not sure Tracy got to see it, but there were several people sharing the memories of them, of their families getting toilet paper delivered in those hour back, uh, in the Fox, G Fox trucks, which seems very resonant uh, with our current times. <laughs> Has some <laughs> special meaning. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, oh, there was a good. suggestion to ask if uh, the grandchildren that are on the call would like to add anything before we wrap up. Don't have to, but... Um, Don't be shy. Tell them about how your grandmother made you go to the movies, on, the travel movies on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not going to force anybody to participate. But <laughs> But it's a nice suggestion, and we're so honored that uh, that they could be with us on this call today. So we appreciate um, we appreciate that very much. Um, so let's uh, give a round of applause to Tracy for a wonderful presentation, and um, I think she really did uh, give us a a new view of um, uh, 
some kinds of women's leadership during a period that we tend to think of as being pretty quiet. Um, and so it's wonderful to get that perspective. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Tracy, so much for um, your presentation. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, stay in touch with us at the Jewish Historical Society. We have uh, other programs coming up throughout the month and the rest of the summer. Uh, we have on uh, June 29th for our annual meeting, we'll be having Avi Pat from UConn talk about his book called Laughter After Humor and the Holocaust. So um, that should be very interesting as well. So, uh, stay in touch and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all very much. I mean, and I want to give a shout out to my nieces who I saw came <laughs> on. <laughs> Please. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Just trying to figure out how to save the chat here. Yeah, ready to do that. I feel like I feel like Zoom will save the chat. You think it does it automatically? Yeah, I don't know. Did you record? Oh, here it is. I found it. Yes, I did record. Okay, I'm all set. Great. Thanks so much, Tracy. That was really great. I love um, I love getting a sense of a women of that era. Um, uh, in that kind of network with that I could see all in a Roosevelt and but it's good to know kind of who else was it, you know. Yeah. It just, whenever I started looking at the those names of those people on our advisory board, I was like, Yeah, you're kidding me. Yeah. You know, and you just don't sort of know there's all these different organizations, but it really sort of it's really quite uh quite something. Absolutely. To yeah. see what she was able to do. Awesome. So, okay. Thanks again. That was that was great. And I see someone here named Rick Koopman. And are you related? You're muted now. Trying to unmute him. Hold on. Can you unmute him? I'm trying to. Uh, if you want to give me a call, I will tell you an interesting story that I don't want recorded. Okay, okay, sure. Thanks so much, Harriet. Uh, Rick, I'm trying to unmute you, but I'm having trouble. Can you unmute yourself, Rick? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a great presentation. I'm really glad I, I, I kind of signed up in the last minute. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And are you a relative? Um, I'm the brother to Brooksy and Rena, and uh, Beatrice was my grandmother. Uh huh. So, do you live in Maine? I uh, live in Colorado. Oh, you live in Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Wow, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Uh, Rick, as one grandchild, of uh of to another grandchild my grandmother and beatrice fox arbach were best buddies so hello from florida <laughs> thanks so much harriet have a good evening you too thanks so much okay i'm gonna end the call now thank you okay thanks good night everybody